flies faster than the speed of light in someone else's dream. Maybe love never dies. Maybe you're thinking of me in someone else's life. Probably true in some other dimension, in someone else's dream. I might not ever know you. Your eyes don't paralyze me. In someone else's dream. Just a pile of dirt I never heard you scream You never told my shirt In someone else's dream I drove right by your house Your room was dark and straight before you play another song like a truth flies faster than a, a, the speed of lies so what did that line was i think that was so good yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> right on brother right on everybody welcome this is micah nelson just so happy to have him here tonight he's been a, a frequent uh guest on our speaker series and so appreciate he's taking the time out tonight to be here with us hempsters so micah play another song please and we'll Thank enjoy you, it just as much man sure Beginning to feel the 
<laughs> oh, Micah, man. Love it, man. Love it, brother. What, what, great, what great sounds. Thank you so much. Good to have you on, man. And just welcoming everybody here from beautiful downtown Hana Maui. I'm fortunate to be in here for a few days, a little R&R &R with, a, with a, my wife, Irene. And but uh, I'm here housed at uh, Hana Farms where they have Internet. <laughs> and so uh, I wouldn't miss this for the world and really appreciate you being on, Micah. And such an appropriate night, too, because I know you're you're a, a hemp. Uh, uh, hempster and yeah. working with him, working with him. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, I've been making so, these time capsules out of out of hemp creep. Look at that. <laughs> This Look at is those uh, eggs. Yeah, from so my new record, it's called Time Capsule. And uh, in, in 20, randomly in, in 20 of the CDs are these time tokens. If you find one of those and you can redeem it for a time capsule. All and then, right. Here's a painted one. So inside the time Ooh. capsule, there'll be a bag of hemp seeds that I cultivated. How and uh, and then you know a little thumb drive with all the music and videos and content and then uh, a ticket to the concert in 20 years. <laughs> right on, man. <laughs> well, I'm hoping to be here for that. And <laughs> uh, be here. and and the kind you're gonna you're gonna be um, playing with Flaming Lips. What April 25th in Denver? Is that when you're starting your That's tour? That's the first show of this uh, whole kind of West Coast run we're doing. Beautiful. And it's going to be your birthday night, huh? Yeah. What a nice way to start a tour. Yeah. That's awesome, brother. That's awesome. I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, four years old. <laughs> four and a half. There four you go. Half. There you go. Well, you're you're way ahead of the game then. <laughs> so. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Oh God, man, this is this is a, such a treat. Yeah. Just love your music and love you, brother. I love so, you. So. Um, Thank you, ma'am. So, Tricia. Yes. Uh, Tricia Bell Story from yes. Vice President of Kohala Chapter. Please grace us with your mana'o tonight. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I would just like to reiter reiterate that that was stunning. Where did you learn to play guitar? Just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't play guitar. I just attacked the guitar and I hope for the best. That's yeah, far out, same. Um, cool, yeah, well, um, as Vince said, I am the vice president of the Kohala chapter of the Hawaii Farmers Union United. And um, it, it actually happened kind of by accident. I just showed up at a meeting, actually the last in-person meeting in 2020 before the world shut down. And um, then I found myself organizing online events for our chapter and then huh, suddenly I was vice president, so go figure. Um, and uh, um, that's, that's actually how, um, yeah, I, I met Cab at that first meeting. So, uh, but we'll, we'll get back into all of that later. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, our chapter. It was founded 13 years ago. Um, in North Kohala, uh, we take place primarily in Havi and Kapa'au, and we do a lot of really stunning work for the community. We have a rich agricultural history in Kohala, um, and we, we do a lot working with local farmers to support their endeavors to kind of heal the lands in, uh, in North Kohala that were really ravaged by colonialism um, <laughs> and uh, you know the motto cropping of things that made money for white folk so um, now now we work on diversifying crops and uh, it's really beautiful and a lot of those farmers come out to the Javi farmers market which is a project that was started by a group of community members and then handed over to the um, Kohala chapter, um, I, I think that we launched in January of 2021, and we have been thriving ever since. We uh, we keep adding on new community members, selling their homegrown products and homemade um, all kinds of arts and crafts and uh, magic 
<laughs> and um, we have an extraordinary musical presence out there as well. So that's it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it's really a community coming together. And um, so, so well, Tricia, Tricia, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, on that on that note, um, I just wanted to uh, let folks know that this is who HFUU is in the communities of all of our chapters. You know, we, we base ourselves in agricultural regions across the islands. Um, right now we have 14 chapters with Molokai just coming on. Uh, Lanai is coming on, it will make it our 15th and Honolulu is coming on, which will make it at our 16th. So we're really excited about um, what this represents for Hawaii in the spirit of what Tricia referenced in healing the land and truly regenerating the soil so we can grow the nutrient rich food we know we need to keep our bodies well and the anti pandemic, uh, you know, mentality of, of just staying healthy, keeping our immune system strong and, and being on the, on the real lane of, of life. And so, um, we're fortunate as a national, as a farming organization that is associated with a national farming organization who also supports 3% uh, uh, THC in, um, in cannabis. And so um, National Farmers Union is pretty hip in a lot of respects. Um, we have a regenerative agriculture local food committee on a, la on a national level. Uh, we just had Dan Kittredge at the national convention who spoke at our convention this past year on his bionutrient meter and it packed the room. So, you know, on a national level, regenerative agriculture and local food systems are coming into vogue in a big way. And as you can see, if you dial it down to our agricultural regions, just like Tricia just shared, this is really uh, where folks are wanting to see not only our agricultural presence, but our just existence here on this plane uh, be about. And so um, body and soil, baby, you know. Yeah. So um, with that, uh, Tricia, do we, would you please um, uh, introduce our guest tonight? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I want to say that's uncanny. I also support THC 3%. Um, <laughs> I actually have been, I, 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 I don't participate in THC anymore, but I have been an activist for THC and uh, uh, hemp and cannabis products since I found out that they were illegal when I was 12. I just thought it was frowned upon until then. And then I was like, huh, okay, let's, uh, let's change that. So um, tonight we have with us Cab Baber. Am I saying that right? Is it Baber, Baber, or I never say your last name. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> uh Cab has been uh, practicing regenerative farming in Hawaii for 40 plus years. He co-founded the Hawaii Hemp Council in 1992 and the Hawaii Organic Farming Association and had the first CSA on the island in the early 1990s, which fed 50 families. Cab was the first regenerative farmer in the Waimea, Waimea Lalamilo farm lots, operating the largest organic tomato operation in the state. He's been a pioneer in the modern use of microorganisms and fermentations in regenerative agriculture, making a soil probiotic, Bokashi, which I've used before and it is awesome, for 25 plus years. Cab has enjoyed mentoring dozens of young farmers over the decades, and his Kohala farm was awarded the first hemp license in the state, right on brother, integrating polycropping of food into the hemp crops. He's a passionate believer in food sovereignty and, whenever possible, encourages people to grow their own food and is a founding board member of the Kohala chapter of the Hawaii Farmers Union United. Gail um, Burn Babber, um, I'm, that, I'm not suggesting that she burns, but that, that's her hyphenated last name. Um, Gail is a co-founder of Hawaii Royal Hemp Boutique Hemp Farm with her husband, Cab, growing and manufacturing high quality top shelf CBD products. And I'd just like to make a note, I got seriously injured a couple of weeks ago and I absolutely think that I am able to walk right now because Gail gifted me some of her CBD oil and I used it. Now I got some other work done 
as well and have used Epsom salt baths, but it was the CBD oil that really allowed me to actually get out of bed and walk on my own without the assistance of another human or a rolling suitcase. Like it was amazing. Um, so um, buy CBD oil. Gail has been instrumental in passing hemp legislation in Hawaii for the last eight years and secured the first license to grow hemp with her farmer husband. She is on the Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association Board of Directors, as well as the Hawaii Farmers Union Foundation and a founding member of the Kohala Hawaii Farmers Union United Chapter. Gail is intimately familiar with the unique programma programmatic and regulatory opportunities and challenges of growing hemp in Hawaii, having navigated the most stringent hemp growing program in the country. She has also volunteered 8,000 hours of her time to preserve Hawaii coastal and agricultural land and Hawaiian archeological and cultural sites, as well as developing a framework for a community agricultural land trust that includes affordable housing for family farmers. Gail has a background in civil engineering with 30 years of project management okay. experience and owns a farm with her husband <laughs> on Hawaii Island. So with all that, oh my gosh, are you in for a treat? Plus they brought extra people to be on a panel. <laughs> Without further ado, ladies and gentle thems, I present to you Cab, Gail, and the Hemp Panel. <laughs> Can you tell that Tricia used to do stand-up? I mean, she's amazing, but I also want to apologize to everyone for those long bios. Yeah, I sent them to Tricia, but I mixed up the emails. That was for something else. So anyway, um, thank you for sitting through that, but you did make it um, rather entertaining for us, hopefully for everyone else. <laughs> I do what I can for the people. <laughs> you, you do. You, you really do. And, you know, I just want to real quickly thank Micah, man. Your music is just, wow. uh, we, it's just such a treasure for all of us. I mean, I got several messages from people going, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe we get this kind of music. <laughs> so but you're a farmer dude and a hemp farmer. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about our company and then um, the national scene. We got some other folks on the panel, but I want to say we had the the privilege and honor of growing out some of Micah's seeds several times on our farm and um, true fiber genetics, you know, old school stuff. So yeah, and I can't, I hope I get one of your golden eggs. That's wow. <laughs> I don't know if you can target it for me somehow. But, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you, you can have one of the rejects. How's that? I've got a bunch uh, of them that I. <laughs> uh, it will know, not be a reject to me. It. I, I would embrace that wholeheartedly. It's oh, not yeah. Accepted. It'll still work. It'll still function. It, you know, it'll, oh, it'll be like more reading. special that way. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. No, we'll take it and we'll put hemp seed in it. It's got yeah. hemp seed too. Yeah. yeah. We, hemp seed. Oh, it comes with more hemp his, seed. His hemp okay. Seed. All right. Yeah. Well, anyway. well, you can always put more in there because we know we're, we're going to need some in the future too. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Micah. Yeah, and I, you know, just real quick, folks don't know, you sit on a national board, don't you? Um, I know you did for a while. I, I'm, yeah, I'm on the, the National Hemp Association yeah. board, but, you know, and I, I, I'm in touch with them. And, but honestly, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, to learning today because I, I feel like I've been out of the loop. I've, you know, I've been using a lot of hemp um, to insulate my house and do art projects and things like that. But I, I've been on tour so much, I haven't been able to grow it that much, but I feel like I'm, I'm not as hip to also what's happening behind the scenes, you know, on the islands, but also just legislatively on the national level um, uh, in, in the same way that you guys might be. So, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that I will absorb today that, that will be enlightening. Yeah, there, there's some good folks on here. We can certainly talk about what's going on in Hawaii legislatively. And then we've got Bo Whitney, who I don't know if you've met him yet, but he's um, a really great economist um, and works internationally and nationally. He'll be um, on our, he'll be here and we'll introduce him in a little while. We've got um, some folks from Kauai that are gonna talk about a fiber project. 
then we've got Greg Smith and Cab talking about um, farming. So um, we, we've got a nice, nice agenda here. I'm going to talk just a little bit about our farm, and then I'm going to we'll bring Bo um, Whitney up. I think he's he's out there. Um, Katie or Tricia can help me unmute. And then I also noticed that Doug Fine is in the audience. Woo, Doug's a hamster. So well, when we start talking regenerative farming, maybe Katie can somehow unmute him and we can bring him up to the panel as well. So, um, so let me see. Oh, there's, there's Bo. So I'm gonna just throw a couple of slides up um, for our farm and then I'm gonna hand it over to Bo and I can share Bo's slides as well. We'll be much more concise since we had such a nice, long, lovely introduction. Um, <laughs> hey, there's a nice picture of um, Cab out there in our uh, field, and you can jump in anytime, obviously, babe. We polycrop, you know, where we're, um, there are a couple of farmers here that polycrop with food, but that's very rare nationally. Um, and you can see we've got hemp there and papaya in the background, and we do. Uh, work with a lot of other crops. We have 13 certified organic crops at YRL Hemp. Um, and that's, um, you know, the farmers can talk about why we do that, but it, it has to do with microbes and structures for microbes. Uh, we're certified organic. Uh, our hemp is also certified organic and regenerative. Um, oh, did I skip that? There we go. Yeah, we're vertically integrated. Tricia may have covered this already. I can't remember. I kind of fell asleep to our own long introduction. <laughs> we're, a, we're a seed to top shelf um, CBD product um, company. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, we've grown um, fiber varieties as well, because the if you're not real familiar with hemp, but we'll just do a hemp 101 in just a minute. Um, there are many varieties of hemp out there. That, like there are many varieties of pumpkins and tomatoes and cucumbers and um, some are uh, more well suited for CBD products and have those compounds in them and others are, are more well suited for other products like uh, animal feed or, or hempcrete that uh, Micah was talking about and Megan will be talking about soon. Our foundation for our farm is in regenerative. Go ahead. Okay. You guys can hear me okay? Um, our foundation is in regenerative and organic farming practices, and we, we address a big challenge. I think a, actually a number of farms out here in Hawaii address a big challenge in the hemp industry, which is, you know, a lot of plastic and practices that aren't so great. And of course, we see that across the agricultural sector, but maybe a little bit more in the cannabis and hemp scene, huge use of plastic. So, you know, we mulch and um, I use all sorts of practices that Greg and Cab will be talking about. We create pollinator habitats, sequester carbon. And, you know, part of the motivation, I mean, our, our backstory that wasn't included in those long bios <laughs> was that, you know, when we were younger, both Cab and I had health um, challenges. And I know that's part of why he, he converted over to regenerative farming and he can talk more about that. But for me, I was a former D1 national championship athlete and triathlon and marathoner and um, ended up in a wheelchair with autoimmune diseases. And so really understanding how to manage my health and really understanding about food and the interaction with the natural environment has been kind of my life's path and is really the kind of the focal point of our company. And I know other companies too, Greg can talk about his company, but we really strongly believe health is wealth. It's a foundation for what we do. And also um, my experience is eating my husband's regenerative food and, and, and his hemp is that, you know, uh, the higher the frequency and the higher the quality of the food, the food, food it, it, it raises consciousness. His hemp is that it's well, I'm getting feedback. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you really. And I, I hear that weird. I hear that weird feedback. Oh, well, now I'm hearing it. Yeah, Katie. Katie, could you mute everybody except Gail, please? Yes. Uh, Katie, Katie, could you mute everybody except Gail? <laughs> Well, that's unplanned for humor, all the delays and the echoing. So hopefully you heard a little bit of what, what we we're talking about. Um, you know, one of the other things, that, and we'll talk just a little bit about the origins of hemp in Hawaii, is that um, the 
so farmers were really the ones that led the effort in Hawaii to bring hemp and legalize it for, for decades. And um, when the movement was kind of reignited around 2013, at a Hawaii Farmers Union um, planning, strategic planning event, actually, I think it was on Maui, wasn't it? I can't remember. Vince would know, it was in 2013. And um, I think CAB stepped up as one of the legislative chairs and along with some other folks. And um, they began the, what ended up being a three-year push to get hemp legislation passed here and coordinating stakeholders statewide. And that was on top of decades of work that he did to do that. But so I know that those folks, when we went back to get the hemp legislation passed um, in 2013, you know, a lot of it was looking at the value of the CBD industry for Hawaii and relating it to food security, because as you guys know, most food farmers here subsidize their production with outside jobs, outside income, whatever it is, a spouse's income. And most farms are financially unstable. Most farms are small. And so, um, we still hold the vision, and I think Greg can speak to this too, of us working collaboratively to create um, a more lucrative ag sector that farmers, uh, other food farmers can grow once in a while, but if they have access to free processing, um, they can then um, get a bump um, now and then in the, in the bottom line. It'll help stabilize food production here in Hawaii and actually make it more lucrative, I mean, more appealing for young farmers. Because even though we've got a young farmers movement, and more access to ag land. The fact is we're losing farmers all the time um, and it's primarily due to finances as most of us know that are in the sector. So for us in it and still surviving after these two years, you know, we, we paved the way I think for something that could be very big for, for food in Hawaii. We're knocking down a lot of the last legislative barriers this year. Um, I'm gonna show a couple of uh, slides of our farm and then we'll um, move on to our other guests. On the left is, um, what what is that? Amaranth? Yeah, yeah, sorry, Amaranth. We should let Clarence give a tour of the farm. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you can see we've got kale polycropped in with the hemp and the papaya and he, he can talk a little bit about that later. And lot, lot, that's a real shot on our farm. They, he, um, Clarence polycrops lavender and other plants specifically to accent certain terpenes and just like, um, well, and Greg can talk about that too. There's plants that just like hanging out together and, and the pollinators love it. Oh, sorry about that. Just more shots of a regenerative um, farming. And you can see that we um, put wood chips down and mulch and there's no plastic anywhere and we grow about six to eight inches of soil a year through microorganisms. Let's see, everything's a little bit slow here. Um, you know, I, I, we probably have everyone that's on is familiar with hemp, um, but I'm just gonna spend two seconds talking about it. It's a plant obviously, um, and it has over 50,000 uses of food, fiber, fuel, plastics. Um, there's studies that show it's great at soil remediation. I know CAB was involved in a 2015 study that showed it wipes out atrazine and Hawaii soils. And if Doug can get up here, I know he um, worked um, on a study in New Mexico. It helped um, our remediate, uh, I think uranium, some radioactive materials. Um, you know, it's a great superfood. It's affordable biofuel. Look at that fun car. Who doesn't want that? BMW is committed to <laughs> producing cars now that include hemp in their plastics. And honestly, if you know anything about hemp leaves, um, oh my gosh, aren't they incredible in terms of juicing them and the, the nutritional value they provide. Um, uh, Bo might be able to talk to the super capacitor market. That is fascinating. Hemp, is, hemp cells are incredibly efficient in transferring electricity, more so than graphene that is used and mined in um, super capacitors. And we've got Megan on and she'll talk a little bit about building materials and Mike already talked um, a little bit about his use in hempcrete as well. Um, it's got a long history. It's been used for, you know, oh God, at least 10,000, 12,000 years. There's uh, relics that go back in different parts of the world for a long time. And um, we, it was um, required to grow in the colonies on the mainland in the US. And then it got caught up on the um, 
ban of uh, cannabis. There's a lot of political reasons. That's a whole nother talk we should do one time. There's people that have wonderful podcasts about how hemp got <laughs> prohibited along with um, cannabis. And um, that might be too small to read, but Hawaii's got a really long history with hemp. As a matter of fact, longer than many of the Midwest states that are known for growing yes. hemp in the hemp for victory. Um, we grew it out here in the 1800s for all the Trans-Pacific um, uh, sailing that was going on for rope and all the materials the ships would need, and obviously during the whaling industry. Oh, yeah. I'm so the thing a bunch of bullshit. I'm, I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> <laughs> More comedy, I hope. Unmuted or something. Yeah, <laughs> something happened. Anyway. Um, I'll just say that there, there's been uh, a lot of strong uh, uh, work, even in the last few decades, to bring hemp back into production here in Hawaii. The Hawaii Hemp Council was founded in the 90s. Um, the legislature actually approved way ahead of most states on the mainland a uh, pilot study that um, to, to conduct research. In 2000, it was abandoned. Um, and we were one of the first states to get a pilot project going, but. Um, Unfortunately, we were very slow to implement that. And um, later on, I'll talk about the fixes we're trying to do to our hemp program right now. And that's about it. I think most people know what CBD is. And um, if not, we can talk, touch on it later, the endocannabinoid system. That's, um, Brittany was maybe gonna be on. She's another hemp farmer and she's a registered nurse and is really good at explaining that. But for now, I, what I'd like to do is um, give the floor to, um, Bo for a little while, and um, Bo Whitney is a, a wonderful hemp <laughs> economist. He's been gathering data all over the world. He's worked on projects all over the world on hemp. And he's probably done some of the most rigorous studies and data collection out there on hemp and cannabis. And so I've asked him to share kind of a snapshot of, of what I saw him present a few weeks ago in Colorado. So um, Bo, I'll, do you need, do you have slides to share? I'll try to unshare mine right here. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to share some of my slides from what I presented in Colorado. Okay, and I think you can, I think you have controls and you're able to do it from the share screen, but there you go. Yeah, there I go. So um, as, <clears throat> and my name is Bo Whitney. I'm the founder and chief economist at Whitney Economics. And um, I, I'm really delighted to, um, to participate in tonight's meeting. Um, and I just want to give a shout out on the music, the musical interlude. I mean, man, that was Micah. Um, I was just so impressed by uh, your contribution tonight. Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I presented uh, in Denver at NOCO was the fact that hemp is not a drug. There's so many different opportunities and applications of the plant. And when we talk about hemp as a drug or CBD, we're talking about the extract side of things, but there's all these industrial applications uh, in addition to foods, in addition to building material, paper, textiles, and the like. Um, and so when policymakers have narrowly defined hemp as a drug, um, Delta-8, you name it, um, some of these hyper-focused policies that have really villainized the plant, it's all about just this one part of it when there's all these other applications. Um, now, my firm has put together a... a, a a survey over the last few months, and we talked about hemp to all these uh, different operators around the country. And some of the findings uh, were really fascinating, and I wanted to share a little bit of those. Um, now, one of the um, aspects of this is that, uh, let's see if I, there we go, um, is that hemp farmers are, and processors for that matter, are seeing a lot of uncertainty associated with 
with regulatory uh, murkiness. And when you don't have a real sound policy at the federal level, then it creates this ripple effect um, at the state level. And so you get these, these uh, state legislatures that are filling in the blanks and they really don't have a lot of education on the benefits of the plant. And as a result, they have some of these policies that just really don't make sense. Um, unfortunately, but they have a profound influence on the overall market. Um, one thing that I mentioned is that, um, and is it okay if I just keep it um, at this level or do you want me to show the entire slide? But um, here, let's just do this. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. Bo. So there's been kind of this condescending narrative about hemp that it's this little sister of higher THC cannabis. But if you just look at some of these um, uh, product categories that hemp can support, even with just a small capture of market share, um, automobile parts, textiles, hemp, uh, hempcrete, um, lithium batteries, as mentioned earlier, um, this just a small capture of the total addressable market makes hemp significantly larger than its higher THC baby sister, <laughs> that being cannabis. Um, and, you know, this $350 billion mark uh, globally is much larger than um, adult use and medical cannabis combined from a total addressable market perspective globally. And so that just shows you the, the extent to which um, hemp can influence the global marketplace. Um, now, hemp has taken a bit of a hit uh, nationally. Uh, uh, licensed acres declined 53% year over year. Um, but I think that that's going to change over the next couple of years. But this kind of looks at the U.S. license market. Um, you know, people are, haven't been able to find a business model to support, I mean, this is salient to Hawaii as as much as it is on the mainland. But um, a lot of people are uh, got in and then got out very quickly. Um, I wanted to also show that um, pricing for biomass, particularly for CBD, is starting to stabilize. So that's a good thing um, because it gives farmers the opportunity to. Um, to have something to rely upon to to plan around, whereas before, when you've had this um, sudden and dramatic decline in biomass pricing, especially for CBD, um, it's really tough to plan your business around a market that's where pricing is really collapsing. Um, now, uh, one of the reasons that pricing is stabilizing is that the excess biomass um, has declined from 200 million pounds in 2020 uh, to 60 million pounds at the end of uh, this last harvest season. Um, this is significant because with less uh, excess inventory, then there's a balance between supply and demand now. And even this 60 million pounds of excess inventory is not really that which is for sale. There's um, probably half of that is just sitting on the shelves. Um, and not ready uh, to be sold into the marketplace. Um, and I wanted to show a couple of things um, just about the nature of the um, industry. A lot of the um, uh, licensees uh, are really small operators. Now you've got some that hire 10 or more employees, but a lot of the, the um, operators, either cultivators or processors are small kind of family operations, but nonetheless, collectively, there's about 100,000 um, employees nationally generating $3.3 billion in wages. So this is a significant industry that people aren't necessarily giving um, its due. Um, and like I mentioned, a lot of the, the companies are smaller oriented. 
um, and they haven't been around for a long time either. And then um, one thing to note is that a lot of operators didn't have a buyer for their crop. And now this is unusual considering the fact that if you produce corn or soy or alfalfa or even sugar cane for that matter, even though it's not as influential a market in Hawaii as it used to be, uh, generally you'd have a, a buyer for your crop, but for some reason, hemp farmers just aren't, aren't in that same mindset. And as a result, um, most operators in the hemp industry are not profitable, unfortunately. And so this is something where there needs to be um, a, a redefinition of the narrative about hemp farmers that uh, to policymakers, particularly that says, don't control this market um, because it's CBD or a drug, nurture this market because of all of the applications that are put forth on the fiber and grain side. And so this is, I think, a key message. It's hemp is not a drug, um, even though there is a substantial market for CBD, but also that um, policymakers need to nurture this market. Um, and uh, in order to make it grow, because once you get hemp for construction, hemp plastics, hemp for automotive, um, once you replace lithium batteries, which are you know, basically taking, um, excavating the land and putting that into a sustainable product um, uh, to support the electronic vehicle market. Once you have hemp for, hemp for animal feed, then you have this global marketplace that is supportive of hemp farmers and hemp processors, um, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. So these are just a couple of uh, uh, key topics that I discussed um, at my um, in my speech at, at, at the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo, but and and Gail, thanks for inviting me tonight. But I just wanted to uh, you know let everybody know that although uh, people aren't necessarily making profit now, I think the narrative is starting to evolve, starting to change to such an extent that there's a lot more positiveness about the market and about the opportunities in hemp. Um, and if we can build upon that, if we can evangelize that with policymakers in a more substantial and supportive way, there's a, a tremendous opportunity in the hemp industry uh, moving forward. Hey, hey, Bo, this is Greg Smith. Can yeah, you hear great. me? Yeah. Hey, how you doing, my friend? Doing great. Hey, I, I wanted to know what you thought about growing hemp in Hawaii, because you know that's what we're talking about right here. Is how, what do you think is the best way for us in Hawaii to benefit in the hemp industry? Well, I, may I just preface something real quick? And I know Bo knows Hawaii well. And first, I want to thank Bo because he's written a number of white papers for us when we're going to the legislature the last three years, trying to change rules. Um, but we, we and, and Bo knows this, we have such a different scale here in agriculture. And we don't have the same history as the mainland. So I think we do have some unique, um, anyway, yeah, I'll let Bo answer the question. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity and I, I produced a white paper on the economic um, opportunities associated with hemp in, um, in Hawaii, um, in, in particular on the on the animal feed side, on the construction side, um, and then um, most notably in the plastic reduction side of things. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a biodegradable home compostable product line, um, then you're not um, littering littering the uh, the islands with plastic bags and plastic cutlery. And I know that microplastics um, are a big deal, especially um, uh, not only on the land, but in the ocean in Hawaii. And, and there's these viable opportunities um, in those spaces um, that can be supported on the islands 
um, with hemp fiber and, um, and then hemp grains. So it's not just a CBD play um, in Hawaii. It's a, it's um, a total holistic and sustainable play um, with CBD fiber and grain. So there's tremendous opportunity for, for hemp in the Hawaiian islands. Absolutely. It, it and we have a whole yeah. market because, oh, sorry, Micah. We oh, yeah. are the yeah. greatest users of um, throwaway takeout stuff per capita in the country. Yeah, sorry, what were you gonna say, Micah? That's great, I didn't know that. That's fantastic. I, I, I mean, I was just gonna say, it seems like there's obviously a big market and culturally, uh, in Hawaii specifically, there's a market for all of the byproducts of hemp. Um, and, you know, culturally, people seem to, in general, be relatively hip to all of the benefits and the, and the products that can be made from industrial hemp beyond CBD um, compared to the mainland. You know, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people still don't know about all this stuff you guys are talking about. But as far as you know, as far as Hawaii getting back to being a producer in the industry, it seems like the major hurdle still is legislation and getting getting past these roadblocks uh, legally so that you have people investing, you know, companies investing in it and not getting um, paranoid about it. You know, it's like all these vague laws and the, these things where like you guys are talking about the, the people making these laws don't know enough about it yet to really be able to be specific with the laws to where the message is very clear. The industry's open. Everyone start investing in this, become a hemp farmer. You'll have a buyer, you'll have a, you know, an infrastructure that you can thrive in, which it's just it's not there yet. And I, I think, Bo, you're right that we're kind of starting to see the tide turning slowly. But, you know, the the cost of rebuilding that infrastructure, decortication, and, you know, all of the companies that are invested in creating that community of, of you know, in industry, it's like that that's being so held up by by the ignorance of of the politics behind it and and so you know uh hey Michael yeah Michael. go ahead go ahead as so. Vincent and and I appreciate your share brother you know uh, just so you folks too can understand that Hawaii legislature is fueled by the petrochemical companies there you a go. A lot of the folks, a lot of the folks are, you know, taking money from petrochemical companies. And, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist in this world to know that they're holding on for dear life to their market share. And it's a numbers game. And it's a long game. We've been playing this long game. We had our first soil health conference in 1998, for God's sake, you know. So there's a there's a uh, an ability for us to puka through, like Bo was saying, you know, just stay in the course of, of people coming out in numbers and getting to their legislators and, and speaking about all that's going on with, with this, the, the opportunity of this crop. Then you have farmers like Cab and Greg and all the other hemp farmers here in Hawaii. You know, Doug Fine's doing a lot of great work um, yeah. uh, in the national level that, that are just, you know... It, Resistance is futile, you know, but it is a long game. It really is. And so that's why I always encourage folks become members of HFUU, help us become more stronger at the legislative level. Gail's doing great legislative work. She's all over this. And, and, the, and the leaders in the agricultural sector respect her because she comes at it from a place of, you know, facts, um, very astute in her research and, and brings that all to the table. And it really helps us uh, be able to have a presence of the legislature that speaks to people's sensibilities. But, you know, the, the again, you know, the money, the money is going to try to hold on to the money for as long as it can. It's just like uh, when Monsanto was having all the, uh, the lawsuits brought up against it, uh, they were making more money than the lawsuits, uh -huh. you know? So 
Let's you know, just, I, um, I just, I just want to um, build on that a little bit. I, I think for the longest time, hemp has been defined by CBD. And as a result, it's misunderstood in all these other applications. And so when it comes to, uh, to a legislative, um, you know, change and reform, um, a lot of them just view hemp as, as CBD and they don't understand. So there's a lot of, um, and as a result of the lack of federal guidance on, on the regulatory side of things, each state has had to adopt these policies on a discrete level, and it's had these unintended consequences affecting the fiber and grain side of things. So um, it, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of um, evangelizing um, about the benefits of the hemp plant beyond CBD. Now, CBD, you know, to its credit, it helped bring um, hemp to the forefront, but it's, you know, it, the, uh, the narrative now needs to evolve and change and expand to show the benefits, not only of, from a medicinal perspective, but from an industrial perspective. And I think um, as a result of the villainization of CBD, um, mainly by big cannabis, um, now it's, um, it's boxed in, uh, hemp into just this one area. And so, um, once the, the villainization, um, is changed in terms of a narrative, uh, through education, then it'll open up, but that villainization has, has scared investors out of the industry. Uh, they don't see the return on the, the potential return on the investment. And as a result, there's not the type of support for infrastructural development, the decortication that Micah mentioned, and, and other aspects of the of the development of the of the industrial applications. And because there's not the money flowing in now, um, it's just slowing the growth of the industry rather than accelerating it like it should be. It seems like what exactly. Vince was saying, you know, the Joining HFU, you know, farmers coming together to make these things more cost efficient for everyone, like a shared decorticator, for instance. You know, lots of people can use one decorticator. You get a bunch of hemp farmers. They all need one. The cost reduces for each one. They all go in on it. And then you have you have the, the processing, you know, and and uh, and you can all share it. Um you know, like I think the CBD profit from from CBD also has been a factor, you know, along with the lack of infrastructure for all the other things that hemp can do. CBD as a market was from the beginning the most lucrative. So naturally, everyone focused on that, you know, and then it uh, that also took away from industrial hemp and then the plastics and the hempcrete and all the other great things it can do to to get us weaning off of fossil fuels and unmute so if i may say a few words uh if you don't mind uh so Bo, i appreciate you pointing out the historical knowledge about uh cbd all of you actually uh pointing out the historical knowledge between cbds and, and uh you know the industry the hemp industry um i had the fortune of um a couple of years ago and with my uh, colleague and i of putting together the hemp for victory act uh, that Congresswoman Gabbard had introduced in 2009. So uh, <clears throat> I'm very familiar with the challenges that are that are facing the hemp industry. Okay, um, but I would submit. Okay, the challenge in facing the hemp industry. Oh, let Let me step back for those who are not familiar familiar with the Hemp for Victory Act. Okay, that 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 was one bill we had put together. There are many different parts of the bill. Uh, uh, the fundamental thing is, is when I approached the congressman back then in 2018, actually, I said, hey, look, everybody is in the cannabinoid space, okay? And, and that's fine, okay? <clears throat> but if we want to be in it for the long haul, what we got to be doing is thinking about the angle of how can we empower rural America? How can we empower 
the small business farmer? How can we empower and create job and business opportunities in rural America where jobs are lacking? Okay, and that came to the point of creating an infrastructure and creating the supply demand. By supply demand, what I mean in, in this bill that we had, iteration number, uh, the first bill, and also, by the way, I. I have iteration number two, which is a whole lot more robust than the first bill that was introduced. But basically, for example, supply demand <clears throat> was uh, directing the DOD to, to purchase um, products, uh, well, actually the federal government to purchase products, uh, chairs, furniture, et cetera, made out of hemp. Um, <clears throat> part of my, the travels on this went down in discussing with the, uh, uh, the Florida fashion industry about converting, um, uh, working with the hotels to, to build out a hemp sheet business in the hotels. So basically what we were trying to do was create a demand for the product, okay? Uh, you, you can go online and, and see, you know, the, the section by sections without me, you know, delving into it. But the hey, basic you know what? Was, You're my dance partner, aren't you? Didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You are right on point with the with what us farmers are um, have learned and experienced have been trying to put out there for decades. We need the infrastructure backing. You're backing up what Micah said too, and that is and it's and, and backing up what Micah was also saying. And I think what you're alluding to part of the reason we all went into CBD is I mean it's a product that farmers can make in tinctures without having to pay processors fifty percent of your crop and money that we, plus we don't even have that infrastructure except for one island here. So it was something that we could do as a craft market. But um, I know my husband was just saying that like, that's not how we, when we were, they were doing like the outreach um, on with the Hawaii Hemp Council in the 1990s, they were, you guys were talking about, yeah, all these, all these other things. But the, so just to, I think, I don't know if we've answered Greg's question and we've got two other speakers we need to get to, but. Um, okay. But I just want to say that what's really critical here is we don't have the scale in Hawaii, but, but the only way that farmers can make money is one, if they hui and we get access to the infrastructure free um, or the government steps in like we've done for food hubs or um, the- All of the above. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But we have to be vertically integrated because, because you know, we can't, it's very difficult for, first, we don't have many large farms here. But if you look at what the prices are for biomass, for fiber, for seeds, for all these things, you have to have scale. Even if you're just growing for seed for food, you have to have at least 10 acres. Well, the bulk of our farms are under, under 10 acres. So we have to be vertically integrated, which means a farmer has to grow it. They have to be able to process it and they have to be able to sell a value added product in hemp. That's not true for all ag and why, but it certainly helps. But, um, you know, and maybe Bo can speak to this, but right now, if, that, if, that is factually what, what us farmers need to be. Able if to I do. may say just from a federal level, because everybody and anybody who are lobbyists, you know, whether it's Ferrari, you know, who was building out, uh, they're, they're part of the owners with what do you call the tractor company who was building out, uh, you know, stock car races. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, anybody who anybody was a player on the CBD side or the in industry side. I have met with, okay. My analysis, Bo, coming back to, to, to where the, the challenges are, it is not because there's not a will uh, of, of building out the hemp industry. Your biggest problem, in my opinion, my analysis is the CD, uh, CBD sectors do not want you to get ahead. That's my analysis based on approximately six years of working on, in the policy side of this. Mm. That might be true at the national level. I, I don't think. Go ahead, Bo. What were you going to say? Well, I, I was um, going to riff a little bit off of about uh, about supporting local businesses and local farmers. There's a lot of conversations I'm having with different economic development commissions um, in different states, whereby um, they're trying to develop these campuses where they have processing and product development and product deployment that support the local farmers in a 50 mile radius. And so the, the cooperative model is starting to come back into vogue because um, 
there's an economic benefit to do so on a local level in such a way that it's not dependent upon international markets or, inter or international supply chain. So this whole um, local support, um, buy local, support local is really a, a sound business model, especially when it comes to hemp. So I it's mean, low hanging, it's low hanging fruit, Bo, right? You know, can, can, can I speak for a second? This is Greg Smith. I, I, would like, I would like to talk for just one minute because I, I'm a farmer and I grow this stuff and I've been growing it for four and a half years and I've tried every kind of genetics and I've done Chinese grow and Chinese seeds and I've done a lot and I've made medicine and I sell it at a farmer's market and it, I make and a Holly really good living it. off of it. And I'm telling you from the grassroots, this has a potential of helping a lot of small farmers to create a industry, even on everybody's given the, the, you know, this bad attitude about CBD. Well, CBD is an incredible medicine that really helps a lot of people. And we have produced it for four or five years and people come back constantly because it works for them. And we have to really embrace that. And I'm getting really tired of people saying that CBD is the problem. It's not the problem. It's the medicine that's really helping people. And this whole thing is kind of, I thought I was going to talk about how to grow hemp. I mean, I thought I came Wait, to we a haven't gotten there yet, Greg. We're still going to get got there yet. Well, Jesus Christ, I got, it's late, man. It's, it's eight o'clock. When are we going to talk about how to grow this plant? Okay. I've worked five years on growing this plant, and we need to discuss. And I think there's people out there that want to hear about that. Mm. Sorry. That's just uh, me. That's okay. I a rising tide raises all ships. There is room for all of us in this space. And we yes. are so grateful for the pioneering work that Gail, Cab, and Greg are doing in the state. Thank you, you guys. But there's space for all of us in, in CBD production, in, hemp, in a grain production, in fiber production. It's a really exciting time and we just need to hang on just a little bit longer. I know I've said that before and I've come on here and said it before, but like, hang in there. You're doing valuable work and we need you in this space. It's I'm called, gonna... it's called uh, Megan, it's called Ho'o Manavanui. And I totally agree and appreciate what you just shared. And, and that's from Growing Solutions. Uh, is that the name of your business? I'm sorry, I didn't, my, my lights have turned off over here. No worries. Um, um, on Kauai? Kauai, yeah. Hemp okay. Solutions, what I'd like Kauai. to do, Vince, is just Gail, talk Gail, about... Gail, do you know Representative Kaheli is on? Oh. Did you know Representative Kaheli is on? No. Uh, did he want to speak? Yeah, That's he's here. Yeah, I just wanted to hear from him. Dave, is he is he here? Hey, aloha, Vince. Hey, hi, Representative. How you doing, sir? Aloha, aloha. I ha happen to be uh, on Kauai myself, and... Uh, driving uh, here in Lihui. And so thanks uh, for giving me a, a few minutes. I've been listening to the conversation. I uh, share your frustrations as well. And, you know, I just want to say um, uh, mahalo for all of your, you know, focused uh, work um, to build uh, a Hawaii hemp industry. I, I know there's a lot more help that um, is required. I support all of your efforts. I know what the health benefits are. They're, they're absolutely well documented. And the potential uh, for hemp as an alternative fiber has um, incredible possibilities. Uh, and you guys have talked about them tonight from hempcrete, uh, hemp foods, hemp furniture. And so, you know, I just want to say, however I can help uh, myself and Dave uh, working together with Vince and the uh, Hawaii Farmers United um, for, you know, really putting together these monthly meetings and these presentations and having some very thoughtful conversations. Uh, I, I hear your frustrations and I share them as well, but you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words and um, I'm, I'm just here to listen. And uh, I wanna work together with all of you to build a thriving uh, and um, very robust hemp industry here in Hawaii. You got my commitment. Well, I, I, yeah. And, and, I, and I, I was hoping that you would uh, share with us tonight that you're gonna run for governor, sir. Uh, not yet, Vince. Not yet. Uh, okay. You know, okay. Not yet. Well, you know, that's what we need. Uh -huh. We need a proactive governor. We need a proactive governor who who represents 
all that you just said uh, around this industry, because in essence, it's just, from my point of view as president of a farmers union, it's not just about a, pro, a, a particular crop. It's about us having an agricultural system, an actual agricultural system here in Hawaii that supports crops like hemp. You know, so it has from everything associated with growing and 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 marketing a crop, but at the same time paying attention to the environment that is grown in, as what Cab has been doing for so many years and educating folks on how to do, and Greg has been doing. So thank you for being on. Uh, yeah, Richardson. thank you so much, and, and I'm sure uh, you know your members are well aware of, and and although it doesn't directly have to do with hemp, it does have to do with the overall subject of cannabis and. Uh, the U.S. House of Representatives and I voted for and we passed and sent to the U.S. Senate a bill to decriminalize uh, marijuana. And uh, that's something that we think is really important. It's consistent with, um, you know, uh, a majority of the states who have already legalized marijuana and um, to um, address the Schedule I, um, you know, federal, um, you know, basically prohibited substances that is on that Schedule I fe federal registry. So. Uh, we've done our job in the U.S. House, and we're going to be pushed on the U.S. Senate to to do the same. And I will I will get off my soapbox, but you know I I, I really it engages me when I see the petrochemical and the pharmaceutical cartels out there pushing things like opiates, you know, and 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 the people just being devastated by them when CBDs are like Greg was talking about, such an amazing medicine. So um, thank you for all your representation and your support and. Um, you know, it's a long game, folks. So let's keep playing it. Yeah, and I've been I've been pro providing uh, inputs into Congress as well, especially on the Safe Banking Act, and especially on the um, the influence of 280E um, on uh, cannabis operators. Uh, it's a tax policy by the um, by the um, you know uh, IRS and. And so that's had a profound effect, a dampering effect on the expansion of the of the U.S. cannabis market as a whole. Yep. Thank you for your um, advocacy on that. Uh, I had a chance to partner with uh, Representative Ayanna Presley and uh, and many and many other members of Congress, and we did move that Safe Banking Act uh, out of the House as well. So, you know, we have great pieces of legislation sitting in the U.S. Senate, and we got to get it done. I was part of the uh, Industrial Hemp Farming Act. Uh, being passed in 2019, I got a petition going, it got over 150,000 signatures, which uh, removed it from the controlled substances uh, category. And so that was a great success. That's kind of my role in the National Hemp Association is, is being a, you know, someone making noise in the, in the culture about, about hemp and uh, hopefully making ripples and waves with that so that people get galvanized to then pressure their representatives um, or, or educate their representatives rather, you know, so that they can better represent the culture. It's a lot more than noise, man. It's music you're doing, brother. Thank you for all your <laughs> you know, work, man. Speaking of that, Vince, is it okay if we run over? Every time we have a hemp panel, we ran over. I think last fall with Bo, we went over an hour and he was on DC time. The reason being we're supposed to have- Absolutely, happen. absolutely, okay, Gail, great. that's not a problem. Got... I, I may, the only problem is, is my battery's running low and I'm hosting this thing, I think. And I don't know if Katie's still up, she's in New Orleans. So we have to change the host to you and then you can stay on. Okay, thank I'm you. Here. I'm here, um, everything's good. Well, you're amazing, Katie. Right on, Katie. Got a little one past midnight, her time. Um, yeah, because we've got um, Megan. We want to hear what she's doing, and then also we want to spend time, just a little bit of time, having our farmers talk story, like Greg alluded to. I asked he and Cab to just kind of give the on the ground perspective of what it's been like here. And before we introduce Megan, I just want to follow up on the the policy and legislative stuff, and let folks know what's going on here in Hawaii. Um, we've been trying to pass <laughs> um, reform to our hemp laws for four years. Um, we've been unsuccessful in the sense that, you know, what ends up got passed a couple of years ago was a get and replace bill that was authored by staff at Department of Ag and it had no farmer input in it. Um, we got, you know, sidelined two years after that. And um, so it's really time for Hawaii to pass 
the legislation to make it so we're no longer the most regulated hemp farmers in the country. <laughs> we, we've been double regulated the last few years at the Fed, um, by the Fed, uh, Feds under USDA and the state. Um, we have some of the most onerous processing regs, but it looks like there's some compromise on that that's going to occur. We've been unable. So farmers ushered in, you know, kind of hemp, um, you know, modern day hemp here in Hawaii. And in the last few years, our CBD market has boomed up to about 32 to $56 million here in Hawaii. That is primarily an import market. Um, we'll hear in a minute from Megan how hopefully we're going to be turning that around and hopefully involving the farmer to do so. But so right now we're importing most of it CBD and we're exporting our money. And that's because the farmer's hands have been tied in being able to access markets, process, and just deal with so much red tape. And here's just one example of what we had to deal with, although this has been resolved. Um, you know, as Greg alluded to, and we'll bring the farmers on in a minute, <laughs> we couldn't even get seed when our pilot program finally got up and running. We couldn't get it from farmers that were going on the mainland and trading seed back and forth from the states, or at least not officially, we couldn't. And um, so we had to use some crappy seed from China. But even then, our great farmers like Greg and Cab made it work over time. And I racked up an $850 phone bill to New Zealand and China because our, our state said, you can't buy seed from the mainland. You have can only buy it from other countries because we're afraid the DEA is going to interfere in shipments and maybe come down on you or come down on the state. And I can list about five other significant things that the state did that put us far behind and many of the other states. And we're just lucky we have hemp farmers like Greg and, and my husband and others still standing because it's been nothing but losses, losses, losses. Um, and I can, I know one farm, another personal farm that's selling part of their farm this year to um, kind of make up for it. But we've got a great bill, SB 2986. It's in um, the, um, in the ledge right now. It's made it through the Senate and the House. We got a little bit gutted, but hopefully during conference, we'll get the elements back in there that allow us to sell biomass, um, make processing much more affordable. And, um, and eliminate the double regulation at the federal and state level. So that's just a little bit of an update on state stuff. And anyone who's interested can reach out to me or Megan's really knowledgeable too. There's the Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association. I know Greg is up to speed on a lot of this stuff as well too. But um, I think what would be most fun is end with farming and Megan, could you, and, and music, but Megan, you've got a really cool project going on and I don't know how much you can share, but you shared a little bit like it sounded like it was bordering on some of the cool NFT stuff that Mike is doing. So I don't, maybe you can't share that part yet, but, but whatever you can share, we, we're, we're interested. And then Greg, we're going to get to the farming part. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I feel tremendously honored to um, sit on a panel um, with people that I really respect, you know, Cab and Gail, so grateful for you guys. So grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you. Greg, stay in the game. We need you. We need you making more um, CBD products. We need that medicinal side. Um, but where I'm focused um, is on the industrial applications of hemp. Um, like I said, my name is Megan, Megan Tally Womble. Um, I am a co-founder and co-owner of Hemp Solutions Kauai. Um, I've been in the hemp space, hemp and cannabis space for about seven years now. Um, my business partner and I were integral in building out the first um, vertically integrated uh, large scale manufacturing facility for CBD. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had a little bit of uh, difference in values with our business partners. And so we exited that project um, and we started to turn our attention to what more can we do with hemp in the state? When the pandemic hit, it was like, we saw stuff running out on shelves. We saw an influx of um, people that were moving here, a lot more building uh, materials that were needed, um, coupled with the costs, exorbitant, exorbitant costs of shipping that were, were coming down the pipeline. And so we turned our our thoughts to like, well, well, how can we make the industrial applications of hemp work? Can we feed our population? Can we clothe our population? Can we shelter our population? And yeah, we yeah. certainly can. 
um, hemp can do that for us. And so um, my business partner and I are working on a hemp Crete uh, business model. Um, the governor, something interesting that's come up this year is obviously the very uh, real need for affordable housing in the state to help secure um, homes for our houseless population. The governor has, has uh, pledged $1 billion to, to put into this market to alleviate this problem. And hemp comes in as a very secure, sustainable, sustainable circular economy model that can help support these initiatives. And so that's where we're working right now. Um, where are we at right now? Um, we have a manufacturing space. We're actively sourcing uh, machinery and equipment. Um, we have acreage, we have large scale acreage. We need much more, we need hundreds of acres to do this. Uh, so we do have access to acreage. Um, and we wanna work with a company that has put together a hemp block model I don't know if that's what we'll actually end up uh, going with, but these are, it's really cool technology. It's interlocking hemp blocks. Um, and that's kind of what we're leaning toward. And it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, some, some problems that we run into, it's the same thing that we've been talking about all night. It's legislation, regulation, um, but where I'm finding a lot of pushback is from the planning department uh, and the building departments and getting hempcrete approved as a usable, uh, sustainable material for building. Um, we're grateful to people like Vincent who have helped uh, put together hemp construction problem or uh, hemp construction uh, homes in the past um, on Maui in particular. I think there's two or three hemp houses. So the precedence is there. Um, and if we can just get our ducks in a row and get legislation and policy on board, um, we should have a lot more forward traction on this. Um, the U.S. Hemp Building Authority has already um, submitted an application to the ICC and the R IRC, which are going to be our um, international building codes. Um, and hopefully that helps streamline the process of getting um, hemp as an allowable alternative building material, essentially. Um, like I said, where, where are we at? We're also in the space of uh, raising capital right now. And, um, you know, something that we, that wasn't as much talked about in that last segment was uh, the tremendous cost of manufacturing in the state. I mean, it really is cost prohibitive to uh, get a large scale farm and a, a processing facility that can decorticate and subsequently put together hempcrete. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at right now. And we're going to be raising money through crowdfunding um, through some blockchain technologies. And I honestly wish my business partner was here because like this, that's his Kuliana. He loves talking about blockchain, uh, but we're got some exciting stuff coming up. So definitely stay tuned to what we are, are working on. But yeah, we're looking to raise some big bucks and start to make a difference and uh, support these sustainable agricultural models to really ignite the agricultural okay. industry in this state. Are you ready to um, take a shower? I hope not. Is there a question? No. Hey, Greg, uh, can you mute your um, mic, please? What's that? Go ahead, you, mute your mic, please. Thank you. Um, so what does the future look like for us in our business model? Um, we're going to penetrate the market with um, a hempcrete funded on blockchain um, concept. And then we would like to expand our processing facility to encompass, you know, grain, fiber, oil production. Like, let's really get back to this. Let's feed the people. Let's clothe the people. Let's, let's shelter the people. There's so much opportunity. Um, but there's definitely some work to, to do to get to that next phase. So I've, that's kind of what I've got. Um, oh, we're going to have a hemp Crete block house prototype on the island of Kauai um, shortly this year. So stay tuned. We've got some really exciting stuff coming up. And I'll be sure to drop my, um, my email in the chat. Um, please reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Um, I'm an open book. I'm happy to talk. 
Um, my business partner and I do still work as consultants and uh, we're helping several CBD companies at this point uh, within the state. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. Megan, that's so exciting. Where would you, the processing be? I know you're, you're fundraising and you've done pretty well in terms of your raise. Is it going to be quiet? I mean, obviously we have the most temp licenses on Big Island and most space, but where are you thinking about, or is it be multiple sites? So we're going to book in the state. We're going to do Kauai and we're going to do Big Island, but there's some, again, some planning department issues. Um, oh, I have something else exciting to share, but there's some planning department issues with, with, with Big Island in particular because of your seismic zone. Um, so we need, there needs to be more um, engineering testing and more accredited um, bodies that are utilizing hemp as an alternative building material. Um, so initially we'll start with Kauai. We are a very stable seismic zone. Um, and then we do have other exciting partners on the Big Island as well that we'll be working with to, um, to do go on both ends of the state. But your, your county is so exciting. Like I just, I adore Big Island. I adore the people, the farmers. They just seem like they really want to make this like sustainability work on Big Island. Um, I think the mayor really does. I know he's, he's very interested in hemp. I think my only concern has been, and I'd love to talk to about this is um, when we talk about fiber, I mean, my husband would love to grow fiber all day long, but I don't, how is the farmer going to make any money unless they participate in the value chain? Because even, I mean, the prices that Bo had up earlier, I mean, no farmer, especially Hawaii, we have the highest cost of production in the country. So how do you integrate the farm? Or maybe we just don't, maybe the farmer stays in the boutique Oh, CBD man. Market, family farmer. Yeah. In my perfect business model, I do not want to do it from top to bottom. I've done it. It's hard to control costs. Like, I just don't know that that's what I want to do. I would love to con contract farmers to grow on our behalf and already have the program or the product sold and distributed to, to the end user or the ancillary, ancillary business and service that's going to turn it into something. Like, I think that my business partner and I would like to, to position ourselves as a processor eventually and teach people and, and help the farmer come up and help the farmer set their prices. Um, yeah, Gail, that's, that's the, uh, that's a, an emerging model where um, in order to provide greater certainty for cultivators, um, processors are contracting and saying, okay, we need a, we need, X amount of acres to be supplied of a certain strain or a certain, um, you know, fiber or grain or CBD for that matter. And so that's been uh, an emerging model where um, now the farmers have certainty that they have demand for their product. The processors have a guarantee of supply. And then it's up to the processors in order to deploy that into the product manufacturing sector so that it gets uh, ultimately to the end customer. So um, yeah, that that's a workable model right now um, that I'm seeing all over the United States. And it's, it's really starting to take shape um, from small scale to large scale alike. You know, I, I agree. I think that is, a few, and I would want it to maybe go one step further. And that is because I know what production costs are here and why we live it every day. <laughs> You know, and e even looking at larger scale mechanization, you know, when we were co being courted by people to go really big, you know, a few years back during the heyday. Um, I really think the only way the farmer is going to make a, a true living here is if there are also some, I know, you, I know you don't, if there's somehow, um, they don't have to be part of the company, but they get a piece of the end product. You know, it's, it's not just guaranteed contracts, but it's like, we're, you know, we're going to supply you the best we can for the next five to 10 years. And you get $1 on this product or whatever, some kind, some form of profit sharing, because yeah. th that has to be recognized. The farmer is the foundation. And without that profit sharing and the value added with our high production costs, I don't, I don't see the farmer being part of the equation. I see what's going to, I mean, and I hope it's not true, but, but you know, what's happening right now is people are importing fiber to do fiber projects because it's just, 
they don't want to involve the Hawaii farmer. So, um, but I think that's going to change. I know that's not your heart, Megan, and not, not no, both. Absolutely not. But, let, but let's, let's look at how we can do profit sharing with the farmer and you're going to see some motivated farmers. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that is definitely something, uh, a, a conversation to be had and let's massage that. And, you know, if I do get on to a project on Big Island where we are able to move forward with hempcrete, like you guys are, are there, we'll be talking and, and I would love to see it work. You know, another option is like a, a dual crop. Can we have a fiber and grain crop? Um, and that really, like there's not a single hemp seed or hemp oil, cold pressed hemp oil, not a single producer in the state. It's a, it's a market that's wide open. And so I think that we can start to do those, those value added products. Um, and you get your cake oh, and you get sorry. to eat it too, literally. So I've run the analysis on the dual crop model. And when you have, you know, two harvests, one of fiber, one of grain, uh, it's actually more profitable than corn or wheat or soy. Um, and so there's a lot to that model. Um, in addition, um, when you've got uh, hemp is great for, as a rotational crop as well. So you can have generate some revenue off of the acres that you may not be able to if you're just simply um, letting the land lay idle for a season or for you know a period of time. So rotational crop or dual crop is is also very very attractive to farmers. Um, you know, so that they can generate some revenue um, off of their land when they normally wouldn't uh, be able to otherwise. Hawaii seems like it's um, got a great advantage as far as the climate too in that in that department because <clears throat> you've got year-round sun and we all know how much hemp loves the sun and so while you know the rest of the industry is sort of dormant, Hawaii can keep keep producing hemp. You know, it comes down to a, a, a matter of genetics um, at that point, right? Because you have, um, you know, it's a matter of how much light you have over the course of the day right? Um, and, and the like. And so not all uh, genetics um, are, you know, um, possible for the Hawaiian um, market, you know, relative to, say, Wisconsin or Oregon or what have you. So, you know, then it then it gets nuanced, right? So it's not as easy as it's my, my seeds grow really good in Hawaii. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I would love <laughs> your seeds. They're, they're great fiber seeds. That's for darn sure. DM me for seeds. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of a nice transition. I don't, Megan, was there more you want to share? Because I was going to bring the farmers on, but I would love to hear more about your project or no, you know, it's stay tuned. There's like I said earlier, I do want to reiterate that a raising tide brings up all ships. There really is so much opportunity. And, you know, a lot of us have been slogging through it for a long time. Some of us a lot longer than others. And, you know, it's, let's continue to build a community around this. Like there truly is an agricultural industry to be built on this. And, there's a lot of exciting things with the hemp on top of cannabis legalization coming up. I think that we just, everybody just hang in there a little bit longer. Things are, that's, it's, it's changing and I'm very excited and just grateful. Thank you. Thank you again for listening to my, my babbling and um, no, I definitely okay. talk no, off to, to Cab and, and Greg. They're, what a, no, no better way to wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. And then anyone who wants to jump in on the cultivation side, but I would, part of I'd the love to jump in from the, um, the consumer end of site uh, of things. Uh, first off, uh, my name is Robert Masters, and it's just a real joy and privilege to be a part of this group this evening. And I'm learning so much uh, listening to all of you. Um, and I just wanted to um, add to some of the points that are being made here this evening. Um, how exciting it is to have some products such as this uh, possibly coming to Hawaii. Um, my background is that uh, as a long time pot smoker, I've always been attracted to hemp and, <laughs> and uh, have always seen the benefits of it and uh, was quick and early adopter 
uh, to seeing the, the values of uh, the business side of uh, this wonderful plant uh, and the medicinal side of it. And uh, I benefit greatly from the medicinal side of it personally, and uh, it's a godsend. Professionally, um, I've been working with a now unfortunately defunct corporation called Sunstrand, and they were early adopters um, over in Kentucky, um, making products such as this hemp insulation. And also- well, I, use, I use that to insulate my house. I love it, mate. That stuff's this great. Is the, this is the best stuff, and it is the joy to actually work with. You can mm -hmm. actually walk away from it and not have to uh, no. deal with itchiness for weeks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then also working with the fiber board, which if compressed at the right density, could be a replacement to um, shear uh, panels in construction. Uh, as Sunstrand were making it, it was not of the required density and so was uh, therefore appropriate for furniture and things like that. Um, but I think that uh, you know, one of the things that would made it really complicated for us to succeed in Hawaii was because the material was created in Kentucky and <clears throat> the way their model was working, they, were, uh, they had a lot of backing from Mitch McConnell. They were working with local farmers. They were getting the materials in. They were great um, scientists at creating amazing materials from hemp. And I was seeing everything from paper to cardboard materials, even countertops um, all sourced from hemp. And I guess some of this material was actually being sold uh, to Tesla for insulation in their door panels. But the problem that we were facing in Hawaii as representatives for building materials and trying to get it into the building industry was simply down to cost. And by the time things were costed out, even when talking to the most well-meaning, green-leaning people, when it came down to comparing a sheet of OSB or plywood to a piece of hemp board, we were not cost competitive. And so I think it's really exciting to consider what you guys are talking about, which is to grow locally and in an ideal world, literally roll it down the hill to a processing facility where you start making the materials, whether it's for this insulation or here's another fun one, animal bedding um, and so on and so forth, whether it's paper plates to uh, replace all these uh, plastics that you're talking about this evening so uh, yeah if we can get into a situation where there's local investment getting in on the manufacturing and processing end of things so that the farmers have as you guys are talking about a place to sell their products on an, uh, a regular basis and to supply materials to these manuf uh, to these producers on a regular basis it'd be just an awesome win-win-win situation around so bravo to all of you the key ingredient, like the literal key ingredient for us, which is something I, I did want to mention, was that uh, all of the materials that we're going to be use, utilizing can be uh, locally sourced. Um, there is a very exciting company coming to the Big Island, um, and they're going to be uh, extracting lime from salt water. Um, and that would have been the only component that we need, would have needed to ship in. Um, and I don't have to tell anybody on here, the cost of shipping is just so exorbitant at that, that point. But to be able to have a truly circular economy with the hemp, the binder, the manufacturing and processing all local, I mean, it's, it's to me, I mean, I'm really excited about it. I'm an advocate for it, but I mean, it's a game changer for the state, truly. Yeah. Was that the really exciting thing that you thought of that you were gonna say? Yes. yes. I'm really, I'm really excited about this, this company that's coming onto Big Island. They're called uh, Heimdall and they're, they're young and they're ambitious and they want to work with the sustainability center on Big Island. And I think it's a really great way to ethically source some really high quality lime. And it'll be a brilliant thing. If it can all be grown locally, manufactured locally, used locally, um, the shipping companies will hate us all love it yeah <laughs> well that that is definitely full circle I, um maybe i should jump into the farmers but i know there were several times you were whispering in my ear tonight clarence about the hawaii hemp council and like you were hearing conversations like 
oh, you were remembering back about like 30, 40 years ago. Is there anything in particular before we jump into farming? Well, yeah, the, the hemp, uh, Hawaii, hemp council was one. We didn't even know about CBD really back then. No, all we knew is that it had all these other great potential with the fuel and the food and the housing. And uh, Hawaii State Herb Association was also uh, one of those venues that I was president in 89. And I said, well, let's introduce hemp. And uh, these are all the professional growers in the state that are familiar with herbs. And again, we had no clue about CBD. It was just strictly another fiber crop, another sustainable crop for us. And we, couldn't really, <clears throat> we couldn't really get any traction there. Uh, it, it kind of you know, was too scary at, at the time for people to consider. So. Well, I guess my point is you guys are OGs. Greg, you're still on, right? Greg's, okay, yeah, I see you. Yeah, <laughs> so whoever wants to jump in the cultivation for sure, but I wanna give space to um, Greg and Cab to talk about their experience growing hemp um, here in Hawaii, because it is a unique experience. And because um, I think Michael was alluding to, we have year round growing here. So if you're growing four or five crops a year, that's four or five, you know, uh, years of experience there. So even in just in the last four years, these guys have 16, 25 years with modern varieties. And of course they're OG. So they've been growing different forms of cannabis, you know, since the seventies, both of them. And they're both food farmers, which is a unique combination actually um, in the hemp industry. You know, you have some folks that are switching over from grain and growing hemp or some closet cannabis growers coming out and growing hemp, but it's, um, not too common to find really good food producers, organic and regenerative food producers like Greg and Clarence that also have a background in cannabis for decades. So, um, and they're both regenerative farmers. Um, so I appreciate you guys hanging in there <laughs> so long this evening. We tried to cover so much again. We always do on these hemp nights, but um, uh, Greg, why don't you share a little bit? I think you've grown a, how many varieties in the last five years of hemp? You were telling me today it's something like 36 and we all <laughs> learned some lessons there. Do you want to share a little of that? Well, you know, I started growing hemp back in 2017, 16 with um, Scott Enright. Right. And I got the contract to grow the, the genetic seed for the state. So I have been working on seed genetics for Hawaii for the last five years. And I, I, I have to say that th we have the opportunity to have the best medicine here in Hawaii, if we just focus on growing the best medicine. So I don't know, I, right now I, I'm kind of confused because I feel like I've been sitting here listening to a lot of stuff that I don't, I mean, I, I'm a farmer, I'm a grower. I'm a guy who grows the plant and I've been doing this for a while and I've, I've grown, I've grown auto, I've grown puna, I've grown Yuma, I've grown all the different genetics that are out there. And I feel like this industry is all co so complicated with all this other stuff when we have to grow the best medicine and we are growing the best medicine. Kevin and I have been working together on his side of the island and my island and my side of the island to grow some of the best genetics that there are in CBD in Hawaii. And he has strains and I have strains that can really produce some of the best medicine that anybody wants. And that's what we do. And we can go into all the other sides of hemp. I've grown 20 foot tall um, Yumas and um, I've grown Chinese strains. I've grown um, Charlotte Webb strains. And we've grown all these different uh, types of genetics and we know that we can do it here in Hawaii on a scale that could, um, I, I, it, it's hard for me now at this point because I just did a farmer's market uh, and I sold my CBD products and I did a $900 day. Wow. And the point is, is that we, 
we work hard at making medicine and we sell it to the people here on the state. And we, you know, all this other stuff that people are doing in legislation and in, in national whatever, on the grassroots, we can make this medicine and we can sell it to people. And, you know, we've been doing it for four or five years and we have people coming back to us every week that wants more CBD for their grandmother, for their aunt, for their dog. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it makes them better. It helps them. And we have to like focus on the potential that this can bring to the state. I mean, when you, when you go to a farmer's market and you have a person come up to you and says, I've got cancer and your CB is helping you, you, you know you're doing something right. And we have to like, don't give up on that reality that this CBD is something that can really help people. And, I'm, and I mean, I don't know anything about growing 50 acres of, of biomass, but I do know how to grow really good CBD products. And we have to like let that grow here. And we've lost this opportunity to make this happen here in the state because the legislation has made it so difficult. But I'm telling you, I have not stopped. I have been growing this thing and I've been producing it and I sell it at my markets and I sell it online. And people, nobody's messing with us. And we're, 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 we're creating some really good products. So that's all I have to say. Good night. Hey, Greg. Hey, Greg, I, thank you so much for the work you're doing. I just want to say thank you. And, and you're doing healing, healing work. And it's a beautiful thing. And I, I, I have a question. I'm wondering uh, if, if there's like a, a specific way that you feel, you know, if, if there are other farmers on this in the state that are, they're wanting to grow hemp uh, so that we can not only um, wean ourselves off from, you know, pharmaceutical medicines that are hurting people. And that's the work you're doing, which is so necessary and amazing, but also wean ourselves off from the fossil fuel monopoly, which is the kind of work that people that are growing the hemp for fiber and fuel and all of the other amazing things that it can do are trying to focus on. Is there a way you, it, that you feel like by by also working towards that goal that it's conflicting with what you're doing? Because it sounds to me a little bit like you feel like it's a bit of an attack on what you're doing to, to also be trying to, to grow the, the wider hemp industry around you know, fiber and fuel and those kind of things in addition to the medicine that you're doing. I, I really don't like it to be that way. I think it shouldn't be all encompassing, but but the point is why, we, why is that i'm just curious i want to learn what? i don't know i mean today i feel like somebody everything's everybody's talking about cbd as being a negative instead of a positive and it really is an incredible medicine and it's really helping a lot of absolutely. people absolutely i watch so much i, I mean, it every day so, I, yeah it's great four years of watching people come to my booth every week and get so much relief from their pain and from their anxiety and from their sleep issues. You just know you're doing something right. And you, know, Man, you don't I, want to take that yeah. away. Yeah. I, I, I feel you know like I, mean? I feel like I speak for everyone here and when I say that you're you're preaching to the choir about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I I I I think that more people are are aware of the work, you know, the the benefits of CBD medicine than yeah. any other aspect of hemp. And I think, you know, I don't think today what what you may be interpreted as as like knocking CBD or, or saying that it's bad. You know, I, I don't I think that was a misinterpretation because what what we're trying to do is, is also include the other aspects of it that are also beneficial that have been, you know, because as you you know you've talked about cbd is such an amazing thing um and people are seeing the benefits of it and they've been 
investing more in that, you know, on a wider scale. And yeah. it, it's got a great uh, uh, amount of attention. Um, but we also, we, I, I think what we're all saying is we don't want to get, we don't want all of the other um, benefits of the plant, like fiber and, and grain and all of these other ways we can replace plastic and, you know, fossil fuels and these types of things. Um, we don't want that to get sort of buried um, under the shadow of CBD. I think they can work together personally. I think it's, you know, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But the only problem is that we're on an island in the middle of the Pacific and <laughs> we don't have the ability to do the kind of massive growing that they do in Oklahoma and Minnesota and wherever the hell they do it. That's true. That, Definitely that not on Maui. And, so yeah. we have to look at what we can do here in Hawaii to make a living. And yeah. we can't, we can't compete. I swear to God, somebody told me the other day, CBD crude was going for $600 a kilo. I mean, we can't produce it on that level here in Hawaii. Because they got places in in Colorado that makes it so cheap. So the point right. is that we have to create a a brand and a consciousness about what we're doing. Because we're not gonna we're not gonna take on the industry to make the fiber to produce for the world. Because we're in Hawaii. We're not in uh, where right. they, they have co combines that do 300 acres, right? Totally. Have totally. Combine. Nobody has a combine in Hawaii. Nobody has a combine in Hawaii. What about just as like, and, and you're absolutely right. There's not enough room even on, on most of the islands in Hawaii yeah. to produce enough to sustain like a hempcrete industry, for instance. It just, right. no. we don't have it. Um, but what about, you know, as far as, even just on, in a local economy sense, you know, if enough farmers are, especially like what Megan's talking about in combination with the big island and, and Kauai, enough farmers are growing it, not as something that they're exporting as much as something that, you know, in a localized market economy can be shared. I'm a, I'm a true well. believer, bro. I believe in the collective. And I believe in the Hawaii brand. And I believe that we can create this, this industry here, but it has to be a specific industry. We can't compete against the world market. We I have agree to with that. our market, yeah. Yeah. the Hawaiian market. Yeah, if, if it's gonna, if there's gonna be a, a brand, a Hawaiian brand that's exporting and trying to compete with the rest of it, I think you might yeah. be might be right that realistically CBD would be the the best thing to focus on as a brand. Um, yeah. I guess I'm I'm thinking more of just in general as you know local local economies you know local companies that are not franchises you know but that they exist here on Maui and yeah. they, they don't want to be importing as much of the products they use you know I'm not an expert so I I can't answer it but I like to believe that that there are enough farmers that can grow um you know, all these different strains and, and provide at least some, you know, if they get together, they, they purchase like a decorticator together, they all share it, you know, there's sure. people working towards like creating these products. And then, you know, local companies might show up or, hey, I want to buy your thing to make these forks or to make this, you know. Well, these you know, forks. Gail and Cab and I have been talking about this for years. We always believe in the collective and believe that if, as a group here on the big island because we're big island farmers that we could create an industry here but it's it's tough i mean I, every week i do a farmer's market on wednesday in, in kona and i sell i sell my cbd products and it just is getting bigger and bigger every week because people keep coming back because the stuff really works it helps your grandma, they help the aunt, it helps everyone. And it helps the dog. I mean, swear to God, my dogs who are 16 yeah. years old are like loving CBD. This stuff is really a powerful medicine. And so we need to like not give up on that as a Hawaiian brand. 
you know, I, I would like to, no, I'm right there with you on both of you on these things. And um, yeah. I, I think I've done, you know, I'm just too bad Ray Mackey's not here. He's another farmer on Kauai, Megan knows him. Yeah. And he and I have had a lot of discussions about kind of just the mass balances and costs of the different industries out there um, outside CBD. And, you know, I mean, it's about four acres to grow a home. I know my husband, if we're allowed to keep our farm, would love to grow our home out of him. So we can certainly do small scale. I think for sure, Micah, it, we have we have enough room to do small scale here. I think from my, and I'm just going to reiterate again, because I, it'd be the one thing I would want people to walk away from when we're talking about these other industries in hemp and, and the Hawaii Hemp Council was founded for all these other sustainable <laughs> reasons. Um, we have to include the farmer in the final product and profit sharing because there's just no way. I mean, when we've costed out all these other products that a farmer can sell the biomass just for other people to make a product. Even if we have a decorticator um, and we have access to, to free processing, you don't make your money back here in Hawaii. It's not that case in other locations, but here in Hawaii, our cost of production are so high and our scale is so small. The, the only way you make your money back is in that third tier when you're actually selling the value added product. So, so mm -hmm. as we move forward and do these like neighborhood models, if we can remember the farmer and profit sharing, then, then you'll always have that foundation there. You'll always have the farmer available to provide that. Yeah. yeah. And Clarence, I know I'm going to, I talk so much. I apologize. You guys probably want to talk a little bit more about like what you love to farm and your varieties and maybe we can go for another five minutes on that and then um i'm so late i know people wanted to close with a little bit more music but maybe a little more farm talk and then music and anyone else wants to jump in we'll kind of wrap it up all right I'll, Kapila, whatever. I'll, I'll try to be brief i, I want to echo everything that greg had to say and also what micah had to say and in this i feel that i saw a video a few years ago about spain uh, roger christie showed it to me and this farmer had just a few acres. Uh, he did uh, crop hemp and he had lots of hemp seed that he had in silos for his own family food as well as his fuel. He also cropped farm vegetables, which he drove into town with his fuel and his truck and his wife had a diesel fueled vehicle as well. So all of his on-farm fuel was made just with a grinder and a strainer. It wasn't big, big operation, a very small Unit. So it makes every independent farm able to actually produce at a lower cost because they're not running around for fuel. They're not uh, trying to you know, keep up with the cost of fuel prices raising or whatever is going on in that respect. And so it was very uh, admirable to see that now we close this loop with the fuel. Now the farmer actually has a chance to make some money at selling his vegetables, where before a lot of our money's going into just bringing that vegetable to the market. So it was very impressive to see that even a small farm, like a four acre farm, the guy's sitting on his tractor, he's got a silo full of seeds for this year's fuel, and he's got another crop in the field he's gonna bring in. So he'll, he'll have extra seed to sell at the end of the year and still have all the fuel for his home, his farm, his transportation, and he's got products to sell along with that. Now, if we wanna go into like a seed operation, we already have international buyers that wanna buy seed from us and we have to put in 20,000 acres. Well, that's quite a few farmers to put in 20,000 acres, but it is possible. And then we set it up in a cooperative me method as we talked about for years in that we all share in the final value of that product. So we do have buyers. We do have people that are ready to build the plate lunches and things like that. If we have the fiber and the material that we can uh, you know, dry and process and, and like that. So it's very up industry. It can be uh, focused around small farmers and we can also scale this thing up. And I strongly feel that it's an easier pathway than a lot of people think it is. Uh, we've discussed many uh, roadblocks along the way, but I will say that our farming methods have proven out that we can do a really good job with this crop here in Hawaii. Our ability to um, actually uh, just show that many different strains, as Greg has demonstrated, you know how they how they work here in Hawaii or don't work depending on which <laughs> side of the state laws you're on. But uh, it's important to to really say, like as Greg is saying, let's focus on what it is we can do. Let's get some really good strains. And yeah, if we had coordinated effort, small farms could raise enough CBD to really bump their their margins, and then they could also raise seed and fiber crop 
as long uh, as well along with that to help um, just keep the whole thing cyclical, the whole community happy with all the things we need, not just the CBD medicine. So I think it's really, really cool that we can have such opportunity. And as farmers, we really like Greg, I'm a farmer. I don't get all this other extemporaneous stuff. I'm used to taking my produce to the market and getting money for it. And that's easy for me. But now when we throw in all the extra laws and everything else, it's been challenging at, at the greatest farming I've ever, ever done. It's very challenging. And I wouldn't have made it this far hadn't been for my wife, Gail. There's just no way. I've been pulling my hair out already. So it's, it's a really uh, great thing, like I said, that, that we have come this far. And I, I echo again, we got to just hang in here. It is a wonderful crop. We are going to see this thing through and it is going to happen for us. And this coordination of everybody within the state is going to be so powerful. We will have a, a, a place in the world for our products. And also just the, the relative living quality of Hawaii will go up because of our products. Thank I you. believe you're right. You're exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to... Wow. Totally believe it. He said. <laughs> I believe. I mean, I've been fighting this for four or five years. I, I really believe we're on the cusp to create some of the best medicine, the best hemp, and it, it will be a part of the Hawaiian agricultural community soon, I hope. But right now, it's very small. It's extremely small. It, it, it's, I mean, here on the islands, we probably got maybe 10 acres. 10 acres of production. And most of us who are growing one or two acres are producing enough to support our industry because we make medicine from it. But 10 acres is not going to create an industry. So we have to create, we have to have somebody that can help us figure out how to put this on scale. Well, and I and just want to make another plug for, yeah. for SB 2986, because part of the frustration and exhaustion is our state has handcuffed us. We weren't able oh, to make markets yes. like the mainland farmers had a little boom and bump. So if we can get SB 2986 passed in its full, that'd be great. Do you guys want to share like a little farming tip for hemp that isn't giving away your IP real quick? And then we maybe you can do some music. I mean, what, like something a farming tip? Like, or, or is special, uh, maybe a variety you like, I don't know, something farmy. I, I, I would say the best farming tip, tip that I have right now is to put the seed in the ground right now. This is, this is the long season. And if you can start growing a, 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 a field of hemp, this is the, the week to do it actually. Exactly. Because you'll get the long, if you put it directly in the, in the ground right now, you'll get you uh, potentially six to 20 foot hemp plants, depending on the genetics. So that's, we're, we're at, this is the best time right now to plant. That's good. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I, I concur. And <laughs> I refer back to, uh, as uh, Paul Stamos uh, shared with us that, you know, we use the best tools on the farm and Bokashi is the best tool for the farmer. So yeah, make yeah. sure you got the bokashi in that soil and you will have the best action you're looking for. <laughs> well, and for people who don't know, bokashi is a soil probiotic, but I guess and, you can and, and, Gage and, and cab sells it. Yeah, and cab sells it, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you farmers for hanging in there. I mean, because truly- uh, I know, I got to go to bed. We wouldn't have anything going on in the state if you guys hadn't persevered with all the- incredible red tape you've had to deal with and horrible genetics and everything else and 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 even with all that you guys have been able to grow compliant crops year after year which is just a miracle under the toughest, oh, yeah. under the toughest regulations and i want to let want everyone to know we have the most strict testing regulations for our products and for our hemp in the country and always have had so what you get from farmers is high quality here in Hawaii anyway. So. Yes, amen. Yeah, I don't know if any of the other speakers want to jump in or Mikey, you want to close us with some music or whatever you all want to do. Sure, I can play a quick, quick one. Quickie okay. for the road. Oh, thank you, Mac. Right on, thank you all. Change some of the words of this one to, to fit our uh, theme tonight. Okay. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Micah, and thank you so much, everybody. I, I really feel that we've put in some good work here tonight. Um, I, I would like to leave everybody with, with one thought, um, and that is um, a, a lot of the, um, the obstacle that we have come up against in moving forward in a society that, that thrives with CBD and with industrial hemp, um, it has been prevented largely through the process of the demonization of THC, which has devastated Black and uh, Latino communities. And so it's really important for us. I notice this is like a, a predominantly howly conversation we're having here tonight, but we cannot have a legitimate successful movement in this arena unless we are including black and latino voices and we are supporting them in this whole process so let's all think about that um, as we move forward with this because we're not going to succeed without uplifting those communities and frankly we shouldn't succeed without uplifting those communities so on that note i would just like to say the end <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> hey, thanks, everyone. Thank really you. appreciate it. And um, reach out. We can always continue talk story another time, too. Mahalo. Thank My you all. It's unreal. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Greg. Thank you, everyone there. Annie, everyone. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you, Katie. You're the best. Hello. All right, Katie, kick us all out.